Josh said you've been on his dream list since he started the podcast, so. <laughs> so well, I hope it is a dream and not a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll get going. Uh, entertainer, singer, presenter, broadcaster, these have all been used to describe you over the years, but if you had to pick one discipline that defined you, what would it be? Oh, I don't know. Singer, I suppose. I wanted to be a singer even when I was a little girl. So, um, so yeah, more so than presenter or any, all those other things were just jobs. But I was born to sing. Eurovision's always been something that's viewed as a novelty, um, sort of a phony event sometimes, which was synonymous with the late great Sir Terry Wogan. How do you think Bucks Fizz's victory in 1981 helped to change the national perception of Eurovision? I don't know, because up to then, we did love Eurovision. Um, I did Eurovision twice, actually. I did it in 1978 and 1981. I did it with Coco um, in 1978, and we came 11th, which was the worst the UK had done at that time. Um, but I, we did have a love affair with Eurovision in the UK. As soon as Sandy Shaw won the very first time, in 1967, I think it was, which is when I watched her win, that's what made me, it gave me my um, goal to not only be a singer, but to do the Eurovision. I mean, I didn't think I'd achieve it, but um, but yeah, that when she won, it, it made me want to do Eurovision Song Contest. And, um, and we loved it in the UK. We applauded it. We, uh, in the, in those days, of course, we all had newspapers, didn't have social media. And so you'd get the newspapers on, on the day of the Eurovision and in the centre page, there'd be all of the artists and you would watch the competition and you'd do your own scoring. I mean, it was a big thing. Mm. Um, and, and when we won, it was huge. And with the fact that we won, you know, it was only five years after um, Brotherhood of Man had won. So we were, it was riding high. And we still, in the few years after we won, we still loved it and you, and the UK still did really well in the competition. And then we stopped doing so well. And I don't know why that is. You can blame it on all sorts of reasons. You know, more recently you can blame it on Brexit. But it just, because we weren't doing well, we started to take it as, I think, as a bit of a front and we started to... Um, make fun of it and and disregard it as important and almost make it uh, make it like a joke um and I don't think that went down very well at all with Europe the rest of Europe because they were taking it very very seriously like we used to mm -hmm. so I don't I don't think it's so uh, that Bucks Fizz changed it I think we had a love affair with Eurovision anyway at that time it's just in the following years especially in the 90s and the 2000s, um, when we didn't do so well, we're not very good, um, not very good, bad losers, if you know what I mean. You know, we were used to either winning or coming second, or at least being up there in the top five. And to get Neil Qua and to come last, we didn't like that at all. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, hopefully Sam Ryder has changed all that. Yeah. Making Your Mind Up is a naturally uplifting song, which has since become an iconic, upbeat classic. But what do you think it was about the message in the song that made it resonate with a European audience? And how did it feel? For There's you? no message in that song. There's no message. It's, it's nonsense. If you listen to the lyrics, if you listen to the lyrics, they're, they're rubbish. <laughs> you need it up and then you've got to slow it down. What? What's it? What well, you got to speed up? It's awful. It's awful. I mean, honestly, if you analyse those lyrics, if you believe that a love can hit the top, you got to play it around. What? What are you saying to me? If you believe that a love can hit the top, you've got to play around. What does that mean? <laughs> Honestly, it's nonsense. I think the songwriter has made millions of pounds out of writing a load of old nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, thank goodness for it. Where would I be without making your mind up? So as much as I think it's awful... 
I absolutely love it. <laughs> what sort of impact do you think winning Eurovision had on the longevity of Bucks Fizz? Oh, we wouldn't have, there would have been no longevity. We would have had, we did have, at, when we did the Eurovision, we already had a top five single. So it had already done really, really well in the UK charts. So it probably would have gone to at least number two, maybe number one, but that would have been it. I don't think, um, I think the record label would have dropped us. And so there would have been no land of make-believe. <clears throat> the follow-up was Piece of the Action, got to number 12. The third single was One of Those Nights, got to number 20. So we were on a downward spiral. And then, hallelujah, the land of make-believe happened. And we went back to number one. Then my camera never eyes went to number one. And then we had lots of top 10 singles. And um, I think that if we hadn't won the Eurovision, they probably would have given us another single piece of the action. It wouldn't have got to number 12. It maybe wouldn't have even charted. And that would have been that. We'd have been dropped. We'd have had a six-month contract, and that was that. And I'd have gone back to doing what I did before, which was secretarial work. Yeah. And beyond music, you have also enjoyed a formidable career as a broadcaster, following the footsteps of fellow entertainment giants such as Cilla Black, Gloria Hummerford, and more recently people like Ronan Keaton and Alicia Dixon. In your opinion, what's the relationship between music and broadcasting? And how did you use your talents as a musician to cultivate a broadcasting style? I think you've got to want to talk. You've got to be comfortable um, interviewing people and being interviewed. And in those early days of Bucks Fears, whenever we were interviewed, I was quite a chatty one. You know, Jay was very quiet. Remember, Jay was only 19 when we won Eurovision. I was 27. And so I had all the gab. Bobby G was not a good talker. He was he was quite reserved. Mike was good. Mike Nolan and I really were the, the chatty ones. Um, but because of the chat that we had, um, I said to our manager, I'd really like to do a bit of TV work, TV presenting. And so it came about. I, I started with children's television and then I went on to other TV shows. I did lots of them. And in the 90s, when I left Bucks Fizz, to have my children, um, I regarded myself solely as a TV presenter. So um, I think it's just, I don't know, I I kind of fell into it, luckily, uh, because it did give me another career. Um, and then come the end of the 90s, television was changing dramatically. It was all going to very, uh, what do you call it, reality TV and stuff. And also, so it's a very ageist industry with women. It's very, very ageist where women are concerned. So, um, you know, the television kind of fell out of love with me and I went back to singing. So it was great that I had the opportunity to get back into singing and get back together with Mike and Jay. Mm. In 88, you joined the legendary Roy Castle for the iconic Record Breakers. How did it feel to join something so synonymous with Roy Castle's unique brand of all-round entertainment? And how did your experience as a singer make it possible for to, to continue the legacy? Um, Roy was, I was really nervous when I, when I went for the interview at the BBC. Um, I went up there, I saw the executive producer, the producer, the director and the great Roy Castle. And I was really, really nervous. But I needn't have been because Roy was kindness itself he never ever made me feel inadequate he never made me feel that I didn't deserve to be there I didn't you know I was I'd done a little bit of tv presenting but mainly I was just a singer I was I was learning my television craft you know on on the hoof I was I was learning from people that I was working with Mark Curry I did a series with him he was great uh, that, that's what I was doing. I was learning from the people I was working with. And Roy Castle was really kind to me. And he knew that I was learning from him and he let me do it. He, there was never any, um, he never made me feel that he was better than me. Of course he was. Um, he was lovely. He was a real joy. And I worked with him for eight years before he died. Um, so I, I consider myself really lucky to have worked with such a fantastic bloke. He was massive in my eyes you know he was a, a Broadway star West End star film star 
um, comedian, fantastic musician, great singer. He was the epitome of the all-round entertainer. And he had this iconic show, Record Breakers, that he'd, that he'd, um, he'd presented since the very first episode. Um, and there was me, this greenhorn, coming along, you know, and, and co-presenting. How, how, how dare I even consider myself as a co-presenter? But he never, ever made me feel that I wasn't good enough. He was, he was just a great man to work with. A great man, full stop. Mm. Um, in what ways did the vast landscape at TV Centre allow the show the opportunity to create entertainment on a large scale? So, so can you repeat that question? Of course. In what ways did the vast landscape of TV Centre allow the show to the opportunity to create entertainment on a large scale? TV Centre, did you ever go there? Yeah. Josh, did you go? You went, you went. Yeah. So, you know, it was huge. And it was uh, it was a, a, a round build. It was a horseshoe, a round kind of horseshoe shape. The studios were enormous. The, the studio number one was enormous. Um, and and in the, the, the back of all the studios where all the props were, it was just, it was amazing to work there. Amazing. And, you know, we used to do Top of the Pops there as well. So I would be there um, filming record breakers um, during the day. And then that same studio would be cleared, painted. Mm -hmm. They used to paint the studio floors every night and set for Top of the Pops. And I would be there again with Bucks Fizz. So, um, and then you'd go to uh, do a smaller program or an interview or something in Studio 2 or Studio 3 or Studio 4, all the smaller studios. And then above all of those studios were the offices where um, all of the programmes, all the ideas and everything came from. And, you know, I did I did lots of shows from the BBC. And later in my career, I did one called The Eleventh Hour, and that was a Sunday morning live programme. Mm -hmm. and, our, and our office was at the top of the building, and we would work on it during the week. And then on a Sunday, we would go live, Studio One again, um, to, to the nation. It was BBC um, TV Centre was the place to work. And with Record Breakers or anything else where I worked abroad, if you dropped the, the letters BBC, it, got, it opened every door, every door. There was so much... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That they the kudos of working for the BBC was enormous, um, and and the fact that you know it was the channel in the UK and, and not just UK worldwide, worldwide because it says of course there is BBC worldwide. So um, it was it just it was I felt very honoured to oh. actually work at the BBC and to work from Television Centre. Just so you remember the Olympic Hour, it was a great show. Oh, great, great. I did that, Um, I don't know how many years I did that, three or four years. And then there was another show after that that I did from the same studio and with the same team. I can't remember the name of that one. Might have still been the 11th hour. I did about five years. And Eggs and Baker I did. But that Eggs and Baker was done from the BBC in Manchester and Liverpool. I did it for, from there because te children's television at that time came from Manchester. But the iconic place to do any BBC programme was from TV Centre. It was great to pull up into the, into the horseshoe and to know all the things that had happened in the horseshoe, you know, all the records that were broken in the horseshoe, and and all the uh, all the television shows that used the horseshoe as a, a central hub of you know activity, it was so great to work there. And they still use those studios now, which is fantastic because um, uh, this morning, uh, Good Morning Britain and the Lorraine Show and Loose Women. Funnily enough, all ITV programmes, they all come from the old BBC Television Centre mm. now.
It sort of leads on quite nicely to the next question. Um, in the same year you started on Record Breakers, you also landed your own television entertainment breakfast show. How do you think Eggs and Bakers set the benchmark for future morning entertainment shows? And how important was it to treat it like any other light entertainment show? Um, yeah, I think that I think that it was. See, the, the I I did a bit of telly from Manchester. This was Eggs and Bakers was based in Manchester, and the team were based in Manchester, and um, we used to discuss the fact that in lots of schools they'd stopped teaching children how to cook and so they were leaving school and going to college or university not knowing how to boil an egg so um so that's why we thought it was important that we did this cookery program but also because of my obviously being in a band I wanted it to be musical as well and yes I think it was the start of that kind of morning program where it wasn't just cartoons it was actually informative and educational and um entertainment light entertainment so yeah I, I guess it was one of the first ones thinking about it funnily enough at the weekend I watched on YouTube two old um ep episodes of Eggs and Baker and I thought it wasn't half bad because I used to keep in things even if I did it wrong I used to say, mm -hmm. oh, well, that's gone wrong. So don't do what I just did because, you know, and I, and I liked that. I liked the fact that it was real. And I used to have mm -hmm. an audience, children, and they used to make things with me because um, I, I wanted to prove that it could be done by kids, not just adults telling kids what to do It was and showing them what to do, but actually doing it with them to see if it was, it was, it was good. I, I really liked it. I, and I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to bring it back. There are loads of cookery programmes on telly now, and I absolutely love them. But it's time for one that is dedicated to young people. Hmm. Josh is 35 and sadly too young to remember the Bucks Fizz's triumph at Eurovision and instead always think of you as one of the great TV presenters of your generation. But sadly, these great shows seem to get forgotten about. How accurately has TV history presented your contribution to the 80s and 90s light entertainment scene? Oh, it hasn't at all. It, it just says Bucks, Fears and Record Breakers. It just puts it into those two, you know, those two titles. I did so much more. There is, sometimes Eggs and Baker is mentioned, but I did so many television programmes, at Saturday evening programmes, light entertainment, educational, um, informative. I did... Um, during the 90s, I did a programme called The Really Useful Show. That was on every every single day at 11 o'clock. Came from Birmingham. Um, and I did, that was live. I did loads of live telly. It was great. It's great doing live telly because if it goes wrong, can't do anything about it because it was live. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas if you do record breakers, um, I did 11 series of record breakers. And, uh, and if someone was trying to break a record, say, in the studio, and didn't work we would say to the audience should we let them have another go and they'd go yeah and sometimes they'd do it three or four or five times you think oh get on with it but when it's <laughs> live telly live yeah. so uh but yeah i did do a lot and it does it does peeve me a little bit actually that they just think i won the eurovision i sang a song called making your mind up and of course we had how many top 10 we had seven top 10s and another four top 20s uh, you know, and, and loads more that didn't get into the 20s. So I had loads of singles and I did loads of telly, but they just think of making your mind up, Eurovision and record breakers. Mm. There you go. Um, a bit more uh, closer to today, June 2011, you reached the final of ITV series Pop Star to Opera Star. How do you think that reminded yeah. the public of your musical roots? Yeah, Um I think that people were surprised because, unfortunately, I even read this yesterday. I was looking at um, the the most successful artists of the eighties, and we are twenty six, I think it is twenty sixth. And the bloke who, or the person who wrote the little bit of wording at the top, 
just said, how did this happen? What a dreadful group. They can't even sing. He just hated us. And yet we had three number ones and another four top tens and another three of four top 20s. We had more than most of the other artists in that list of 100 artists from the 80s. And he slagged us off because he didn't like us. And it's so stupid. It's so stupid Mm. that people do that because he didn't like us. They can't sing. Actually, we all can. We can all sing. And I'm grateful for pop star to opera star because... That was blimmin' hard, you know, singing opera is not easy. I'm not saying that I'm an opera singer, but I did do my best. And I came second, so I did all right. I was proud proud of myself. Mm. Um, Friday the 22nd of March 2013, BBC Television Centre closed its doors for the final time. What was your reaction to this? I was absolutely gutted. And the last thing I did there, I did a television um, interview. They did it, rather than doing it from a studio they did it from an office it was awful it was awful and but I still I was given the lanyard saying BBC set television center and the date and it was the day before they finished I think it was and I've still got it here somewhere um I just thought it was a really sad day but I didn't realize Mm -hmm. that they were going to keep those um studios open and basically let anybody use them they're for rent so you know as I say, ITV used them most of the time. Um, but the, the funny thing about Television Centre now is that all of those offices that used to be are now flats. People live in them. And on the top floor, yeah. there's a club and a swimming pool and all these things that, you know, they used to be the BBC canteen and that people used to make fun of, the terrible BBC tea and the BBC bar. After Top of the Pops, we would all go to the bar and chat. And it was it was lovely. Um, and it's all gone because now people live there and different offices there. And as I say, there's nightclubs there and restaurants. But thankfully, still, the studios are, are on that bottom level. Um, we used to have, because Record Breakers was... Um, because I did it for so long, we used to have our picture up on the wall, which was, it, it, you kind of feel like you've made BBC history when your picture is on the wall at Television Centre. It's not there anymore, obviously. But, um, yeah, I'm, I was, I'm glad that I was a part of those years. I'm really glad. And the fact that I saw it just before it closed, it was a very sad day. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at broadcasting as a whole, how significant is TV Centre in the story of British popular culture? Oh, huge. It's massive. I mean, I don't know when it was built. I don't know if it was purpose built purely for the BBC, because let's face it, the BBC was the only channel at one time before ITV came along. Um, so it was, it's massive. And the, and the fantastic programmes that came from there amazing programs that came from the BBC. They were responsible for such iconic and huge um, television programs, a light entertainment and, uh, and, you know, the Queen's speech and all this malarkey. It was, it was, um, it was massive. And you really felt proud and privileged to work for the BBC. You really did. And like I said earlier, it really opened doors. It really did. You would go along. I, I remember being in America going to um, do do something, some filming. And they go, so sorry, you can't come in here. And we'd go, we're with the BBC. And they go, oh, we'll come in. It just, it truly did literally open doors. Yeah. Uh, BBC, I still think, I love the BBC. I still do. And I think it would be awful if, because lots of people think it's time for it to finish and that we, you know, we have adverts on the, you know, it's a, it's a, same as all the other independent stations. I think that would be awful. I love the fact mm. that it's a it's our it's our national station. We own it. We pay for it. What's the legacy of TV Centre? Um, well, the the fantastic television programmes that have come from it. The um, you've you've only got to look. You've only got to look through the years at what has come out of TV Centre and the artists that have made their name from TV Centre. It's, you you need to look at it. It, It's jaw dropping, the programmes that came from it 
and how iconic they were, how massive they were, with thousands and thousands and thousands of millions and millions rather of viewers, you know, even record breakers. Um, there was one year when we when we were usually we went on at four thirty in the afternoon. It was a children's program, but mm-hmm. it was hugely popular with adults as well. There was one year when it went on at five pm, and our audience then was seven million. That's a children's television program, mm-hmm. but on the BBC, it was it was massive. And now, you know, seven million. They go well on a Saturday evening. Wow, we had a fantastic viewing figures last night. Seven million. Yeah, well, we did it in in the 1990s with a children's program yeah. you know, on the BBC. Yeah. yeah. Um, looking back at your career, what's your proudest achievement? Oh, winning Eurovision, of course. I mean, it was it was my dream as a child and to fulfil my childhood dream was beyond anything I could have ever hoped for. So... Um, and I'm incredibly proud of it. It's only five people from the UK. Well, Katrina's not from the UK, but, you know, five UK entries that have won in since 1950, what is it, six or something. That's pretty fantastic, really. And I'm I'm thrilled that, that I'm in a band that, that won the Eurovision Song Contest. Mm. It's great to do other stuff. It was great to do the Christmas Top of the Pops and, you know, it's great to p- p- appear at the Albert Hall and meet the royal family and all those... You know, they're all the all the perks of the job, but winning the Eurovision gave me the opportunity to to enjoy those perks. You know, and be talking to you now. Without winning the Eurovision, I wouldn't be talking to you. Um, I wouldn't live where I live. I wouldn't have married the man I married. I wouldn't have had my children. You know, there's it changed my life completely. So it's yeah. absolutely the best thing that ever happened to me. Last question: What's next for Cheryl Baker? Um, well, Eurovision in Liverpool, come on. I'm so excited about it. And the phone will not stop ringing. I've got a friend of mine is my PA, um, Elaine, and she keeps, you know, Josh, probably that my real name is Rita, don't you? Yeah. 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 So she rings, she goes, Rita. The phone, she said, it won't stop ringing. They want you here, they want you there, they want you to do this, they want you to do that. It's incredible. I can't mm. wait. So we've got a big gig on the 31st of March at the um, Indigo at the O2. That's going to be a lot of fun. We're really looking forward to that one. But then after that, it's Eurovision. I mean, there are lots of gigs in between. We're doing a gig this Friday at Butlins in Skegness, um, mm. an 80s weekend. And the following weekend, we're doing one in Minehead. So we, we work all the time. But the things that I'm most looking forward to at the Indigo, 31st of March, and Eurovision. Eurovision from the UK. I know we didn't win. I, I'm a massive fan of Sam Ryder. He's, he's put back the pride that we used to have back in the 80s. He's, he's made it cool to like Eurovision again. So um, so looking forward to that. Yeah. Just ask, will you have a part to play in Liverpool? Will you be there working or? Um, we're doing gigs. We're doing gigs um, and making appearances. But the actual Eurovision, the BBC haven't asked us to be there yet. I mean, we have to remember that although it's the BBC uh, host, well, they're putting it on and it's coming from the UK, but the hosts and the host company, of course, is Ukraine. Mm. So I'd like to think that all the past present, uh, the past winners from the UK will be invited. I'll be really gutted if we're not invited mm. they're leaving it a bit late but um so i really want to be there i really want to be there um but we will be in liverpool i've rented an airbnb so me and all the family are going to be there mm. Cost of all- <laughs> <laughs> lovely <laughs> well that's all the questions we've got all right so yeah thanks very much for your time it's been a great well, pleasure it's nice to talk to you and nice to talk to you josh yeah.